Hey, good evening. Uh, sorry this video is so late. I had some internet issues earlier today, but they're fixed now. So I hope you can forgive me for the lateness of this video. Um, this is probably the second most requested video of the semester because this is the other half of the Protestant Revolution. And um, we've got to talk about two more reformations here. We've got the English Reformation and we've got the Catholic Reformation, also known as the Counter Reformation. All right, so English Reformation is first. Uh, some causes. Uh, first of all, there's a picture of King Henry VIII, so if you don't know what he looks like, there he is. Um, one of the causes is the War of the Roses. Uh, the War of the Roses is still fresh in everybody's mind. Uh, and King Henry VIII was worried that if he didn't have a son, that England could plunge itself back into war. So this is, the English Reformation partially is an attempt to keep his bloodline going, but it's also an attempt to make sure that the peace is kept in England. Another cause of the English Reformation is Henry needs a divorce. He can't have a son with his first wife, and so he has to find a way to get a son. And then there's this want for revenge, this want for power. Henry is going to rebel against the Pope because the Pope doesn't annul the marriage between he and Catherine of Aragon, and it's kind of like a power trip. I can do what I want. I kind of think of it like a a tantrum a child might might have. All right, so we all know Henry VIII has a couple wives, but you may not know a lot about them. Uh, his first wife is Catherine of Aragon, and he is going to be married to her from 1509 to 1533. Uh, Henry had an older brother, and Henry's older brother dies before he can become king, and Catherine of Aragon was actually supposed to be the wife of Henry's older brother. In fact, Catherine and Catherine, or Catherine and Henry's older brother were married. However, um, they never consummated the marriage, meaning that Catherine and Henry's older brother never slept together. So when Henry's older brother dies, Catherine is then going to be married to Henry in an attempt to keep peace between Spain and England. Well, Catherine and Henry, they have one child. Um, Catherine and Henry have a girl named Mary. And the marriage is going to end in divorce when Catherine can't produce a male. Now, the story behind this Henry starts to say, you know what, I think that Catherine and my brother slept together. And in Catholicism, if it was proven that Catherine and Henry's older brother had actually slept together, then the marriage between Catherine and Henry would have been null and void. However, no matter what, no proof could be shown that Catherine and Henry's older brother ever slept together. Catherine was a little kid when the marriage happened. I think she was actually nine when the first marriage occurred. Because no proof that Catherine and Henry's older brother had ever done the deed, so to speak, occurred, the Pope refused to annul the marriage. Now, Henry is going to retaliate by taking England out of control of the Pope. Uh, Henry is basically going to excommunicate the Pope and say, I am now the leader of the church. And one of the first things he does is he appoints a new priest, a guy named Thomas Cranmer. And Thomas Cranmer is going to annul the marriage between Henry and Catherine. Now, Henry's going to get married to a girl named Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn was one of Catherine's maids. And Henry and Anne Boleyn are going to be married from 1533 until 1536. Anne Boleyn has a child. That child's name is Elizabeth. And when Anne Boleyn cannot produce a male heir, she's accused of adultery, arrested, and beheaded. So Henry has to find a new wife, and the new wife is Jane Seymour. Jane Seymour was friends with Anne Boleyn, and they're going to be married from 1536 until 1537.
Jane and Henry, they have a son. The son's name is Edward. Edward is very sickly. And Jane is going to die shortly after she gives birth. I think it's less than a week later that Jane dies because of complications from the childbirth. Now Henry, if you remember, was a second son himself. And so Henry wanted to make sure he had a second son just in case the first son dies. So he's going to go and find Anne of Cleves. And uh, they're going to be married in 1540 and divorced in 1540. And the best way I can put this, Henry has buyer's remorse. Uh, Henry is given paintings of Anna Cleves. Henry is told by other people Anna Cleves is beautiful and gorgeous. And it turns out um, not to be mean. She was rather plain. And Henry's expectations didn't live up to the reality. And so he basically had buyer's remorse and refused to sleep with Anna Cleves just so that he could annul the marriage. Uh, Catherine Holler Howard, um, he marries her in 1540. They're married until 1541. She actually does commit adultery and she's beheaded for it. And then finally, there's Catherine Parr. Catherine Parr is going to be married to Henry from 1543 until 1547. And our best evidence is that Catherine and Henry actually did like each other. In fact, they, they probably even loved each other. Um, Catherine meets Henry through his oldest daughter, and Catherine and Henry fall for each other. Um, but towards the end of their, of their marriage, Henry starts to have suspicions about Catherine and almost has her arrested until Catherine talks him out of it. Uh, and then Catherine is going to actually outlive Henry. Henry VIII dies in 1547, but she is going to uh, continue living for another... 15 years. Alright, so I told you some of this. Henry is going to ask the Pope for permission to divorce. The Pope says no. Henry excommunicates the Pope, names himself the head of the church. Uh, what I didn't tell you though is he names himself the head of the church. And that's important because if you disagree with Henry excommunicating the Pope, that means you're disagreeing with the king. And if you disagree with the king, that's the same thing as treason. And guess what? Treason was punishable by death. Henry's also going to dissolve the monasteries. He's going to give all the land to his friends. That way, if the Catholic Church ever does come back, it would be almost impossible for the Catholic Church to get all their land. And then Henry makes a deal with Parliament and says, hey, if you legitimize everything I'm doing, I'll give up some of my power to you. So Parliament goes along with it because they benefit. Now, overall, Henry's church is still Catholic. They just get rid of the Pope. Uh, there are some Protestant ideas, such as marriage for priests, that develops over time. But for the most part, then and today, the church that King Henry starts is Catholic. Uh, you might have heard of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, or the Episcopalian Church. All of those are the same thing. I have a friend who was raised Catholic, and he married an Episcopalian, and now he goes to an Episcopalian church, and he's told me, you know what, it's Catholic white. They do almost the same thing that he did when he was in the Catholic church. Now what happens after Henry? Uh, first thing, Edward does become king, he's Edward VI, but he dies very young, he dies before he's 18. Queen Mary is going to become queen in 1553. In 1553, she's going to try to bring back Catholicism. This is the daughter of Catherine of Aragon. Um, she was raised Catholic, and she tries to bring, bring the idea of Catholicism back. Uh, queen Mary, she's going to murder anyone who helps her dad divorce her mom, including... Um, several members of the church and then just like a thumb in the eye she marries Prince, or, uh, King Philip II of Spain and this is going to lead to a war between France and Spain it's also going to lead to the removal of Queen Mary as queen so next up is Queen Elizabeth I and she's kind of going to take a uh, more pragmatic approach she's going to find a middle ground between Protestantism and Catholicism uh, 
She develops the Articles of Faith. In the Articles of Faith, to simplify, uh, Queen Elizabeth is going to say, you have to attend a Church of England service, but whatever you do behind closed doors is your business. As long as on the outside you look like you're a member of the Church of England, I don't care what you do in your private life. The other thing she asks for, she wants loyalty from everybody. All right, the Catholic Reformation. This is a little bit shorter. Um, overall, the Catholic Church, they're going to say, you know what, we're right. All these Protestants are wrong. Um, they're going to really kind of turn a blind eye to everything. Um, they're going to start some new religious orders, though. They're going to, uh, the Pope is going to say this has nothing to do with Martin Luther. This has nothing to do with anything the Protestants are saying. This is what we think we need to do. Uh, we were going to do this anyways, whether the Protestant Reformation happened or not. But we'll create some new religious orders. Uh, you got the Ursuline nuns. The Ursuline nuns, they are dedicated to education. They're going to train future wives. They're going to train future mothers. Why? Because these future wives and future mothers are going to then raise their families to be good Catholics. You also have the Carmelite nuns. They're nuns who live in extreme poverty. They're nuns that go without shoes. And that's to show that no matter what Protestants say, the Catholic Church cares about the poor. If they're not all about rich, wealthy people. And the Carmelite nuns are supposed to show, look, we care about the poor. We have the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits. Uh, they're founded by a guy named Ignatius Loyola. Uh, Loyola, before he becomes the founder of the Society of Jesus, is a soldier. He's a warrior, and he's employed by the Catholic Church to basically become the stormtroopers for the Pope. Whenever the Pope needs somebody converted, the Jesuits are the ones sent. Whenever the Pope needs somebody to create a school or become a missionary, the Jesuits are the ones who are sent. So, the Jesuits, they're like stormtroopers. That's how I always consider them, at least. Uh, last but not least, you got the Council of Trent. This is a 20-year-long meeting, basically, that is going to happen. Um, the Pope is very hesitant to call the Council of Trent because the last time the Pope called a council, three popes got fired and a new one was hired. So, there was real pressure against calling a council, but eventually... The Pope has no choice. And at this council, uh, the basic Catholic doctrine is going to be reinforced. This is the we're right, you're wrong method. Uh, the council is going to determine that justification is not by faith alone. You have to have faith and you have to have good works. The Bible is not the sole source of authority. The Pope has a say in it and so do church elders. The cult of Mary, yep, that's going to stay. Saints, yep, we're going to keep that. Pilgrimages, yep, you're still required to do that. And transubstantiation, they're all confirmed. So for real, the Catholic Church says we're right, everybody else is wrong, and we're going to stick to the plan. We're going to keep doing everything the way it should be. All right, um, I meant to put the secret word in earlier, but I kind of got on a roll, so I'm going to give you your secret word now. Your secret word is internet. Why internet? Because once again, I had those problems earlier today, and that's why your video is late, and I apologize um, for the lateness of this video. So the secret word is internet. All right, the other thing I want you to do, let me turn this around so you can see me. I want you to continue working on your SLO essays. Uh, I am grading the rough drafts. I got one class done today, and so I hope to get the rest of them done by uh, Friday or Saturday at the latest. So continue working on those. If I've sent you back your rough draft, make sure you read the comments that I gave you. Uh, my goal is to help you make the best paper you can. Uh, also, work on those museum reviews. You don't have much else to do, so look at the museum websites or watch a video. Uh, one, some of those films are actually really, really good. But um, until then, um, if you're going to take a summer class, register for summer classes. We have plenty of seats available, not only in my classes, but in pretty much every class you can find. And uh, have a good weekend. We'll talk to you again on Tuesday. We'll see you later.